Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. We'll just wait for everybody to come in. So I see, oh, we have a good afternoon from Myanmar, from Khlatun. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. So we're waiting for your for the other participants to come in. So just sit back and uh, hold on a little bit. <laughs> Thanks to you. <laughs> And then we have Trin Huang Hong Hue. I'm so sorry if I murdered your name. Sorry, sorry. But um, I'm, I welcome you uh, from Ho Chi Minh City. And we have several more. Hing, good afternoon, Hing. From Malaysia, we have Mohammed Saeed Jawad, also from Malaysia. Hello. Somebody from the Philippines, Jennifer Francisco. I hope you are preparing because it seems that we are going to get a really big typhoon in the next days. So better stock up uh, with all the, ne the nece necessities because uh, it's going to be a big one. Uh, we have Min, hi, hi Min from Vietnam. Uh, we have Ruth from Indonesia. And then we have Kim from Bac Lu City in Vietnam. So quite a quite an interesting group. So we're just waiting for people to come in uh, right now. So our speaker is already here, of course, very excited to speak with all of you. Good and afternoon, everybody. Like, yeah, it's actually good morning from his end. He woke up really early just to be with us. So thank you so much, Marco. It's about 9 a.m. Uh, in Germany uh, right yes. now. Yes, that's correct. Yes, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Na Le uh, from Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so I think we're stalling with the with the attendees. So maybe we maybe we can start in in the next seconds. You're you're ready now, right, Julian? Ah yes, Atajan, I'm already live. Okay, all right, awesome. So we have Ratna Lindawati from Indonesia. And then Fung Hong from Kantho City, Vietnam. So a lot of people from Vietnam. Um, we had a nice uh, webinar la yesterday uh, from Vietnam as well. We signed a, a memorandum of understanding with Nasati Most. Um, so we are so super excited because that means that we can plan several activities in the next year, uh, specifically for scientists and researchers in Vietnam. So you will get to see more of us. Okay, so I think the rest uh, will, be, will be streaming in uh, a bit later, uh, but I don't want to waste any time because we only have an hour. So my name is Jenny Elmako. Um, I should change my Yoraxis name here. I will do that in a bit. Um, and I am one of the regional coordinators of Yoraxis in ASEAN. And welcome to U EU Research and Innovation Days ASEAN 2021. As you know, this is a flagship event of Euraxis ASEAN and its partners. So we have the partners of the EU delegations in ASEAN um, and also the science and technology ministries in ASEAN. So for example, in, in, in Vietnam, we, we have Nasati Mos who's been very, very, very helpful with us, but also in Thailand, we have NASTA and also in Indonesia, in, in Malaysia, and in Singapore. So thank you so much. And also in the Philippines uh, with DOST. So every, all of the, the ministries of science and technology in ASEAN have been very supportive. And we would like to thank you, especially as we wind down the last two webinars of European Research and Innovation Days in ASEAN. So as you know, our 2021 edition is dedicated to the topic of climate change and science diplomacy. And so today is particularly interesting, especially for me, uh, because uh, it is a discussion not only about science, but also about entrepreneurship and business and, you know, looking at the third sector when you look at your, your science and your research. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce to you our speaker. Um, he is a scientist but also a very active entrepreneur. He has founded two startup companies and manages a nonprofit organization. I think we can learn time management also from this person. <laughs> Currently, he is involved in two EU projects about improving doctoral education and including entrepreneurial skills. He also facilitates workshops on entrepreneurship for researchers 
The curriculum of his courses is based in his experience in research, business, and entrepreneurship and management. He has a master's of science in chemistry and a PhD in physics and has worked as a professor of theoretical chemistry for 10 years in the University of Sassari. He has published many high impact papers in science and other highly marked journals. He has participated in European projects and collaborated with diverse research teams across the world. And he also holds a master's of business administration from the Frankfurt School of Business. We're the same actually, uh, Marco. I did my PhD and then I went back and did my MBA. And I think today you will discuss to us why you're doing that and why you are also you know, in all of these different things. So without further ado, I am pleased to welcome, and please help me uh, to generously welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Marco Masha. Marco, the floor is yours, thank you. Thanks a lot for a very nice and kind introduction. Thanks a lot for inviting me also to give this, this talk. So let me uh, share my screen for, for the presentation today. Um, I just wanted to tell people that um, there, is, there are two different options to, to send questions. One is using the chat, the other one is using the Q&A button. I kindly ask you to, to prefer the Q&A because it's easier to go through the questions. You can also vote them up and down, I think, uh, so that if people like some question on the Q&A, they can just thumb it up so that it goes up as a priority. And um, yes, and, and please feel free to send the questions also during my, my talk so that if there is something that you would like to know immediately, you don't have to wait until the end of the, of the presentation. So welcome uh, to, 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 to this session. And I would like to, to start with a story. As Jenny said, I, I, I used to be a researcher, an active researcher. I, I still feel as a researcher, but I'm not doing research anymore. And it all started with my uh, master's degree in chemistry, where I was stu studying uh, something related to, to the chaos theory, uh, theory in chemistry. So the, um, some of you might not know this, but this is a typical uh, scenario, pathways, that leads to, 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 to chaos. You see that things are, are kind of well behaved at the very beginning for the low values of the control parameter R. And then there are bifurcations, right? So there are points where the system can go either up or down, right? And then there, there, is, there are more and more bifurcation until at the end, there are so many that you cannot, uh, that you have so many options, right? And I would like to, to use these to make a parallel with some careers. M many careers are linear, just you know, for, like it is here for the low value of R, but some are not that linear. So if, if you look at my own story, for example, with age, um, here there is a kind of job satisfaction, you can call it as you want, right? And then um, there is the first bifurcation in my life. And then th there have been so many others that, uh, as Jenny said, I need a, a bit of time management skills also to go through all the things uh, I am I'm doing. But the satisfaction is actually very high. So I don't regret that. So the first, the first linear thing is about studies, right? So you study, maybe you dedicate yourself to some hobbies, sport, music, whatever, right? But and that's, that's basically your main path during uh, young ages. Then later on, I started doing PhD and research, right? But then um, I started being interested in innovation and, uh, and also uh, and collaborating with the private sector and then with the third sector, so not for profit, right? And, 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 and it was in different roles until it, it, it led me to, to management also. So you see, there are all these different um, aspects of my career and all of them are not actually connected that linearly as I presented them, but it's rather chaotic like this, okay? So I jumped from one to the other. I am doing mainly some of these things at the same time. Others, uh, I quit for a while and then I, came, I went back to that. So, you know, it's a bit chaotic. So I wanted to, to start with this story just to show that, I mean, uh, careers are never linear as they are 
uh, most of the time introduced. You can, of course, make your plans for future. It's always good to plan, but sometimes opportunities come, come up and you might want to change your original plan. And very quickly, because everything was already said about me, I have 15 years of experience in research, seven years of experience in management, and five years in entrepreneurship. So very quickly, yes, I, I, I used to be assistant professor and so in, in theoretical chemistry, and that's where my research experience is. As for management, besides the Master in Business Administration, I am right now executive coordinator of a not-for-profit organization, uh, but also managing director of a company. And I used to be a vice chair and then board member of the Marie Curie Alumni Association, which is an international not-for-profit organization based in Europe. And finally, I started two companies, but I'm also advisor of many in startup. I've been advising more than 100 startups so far. I am mentor of the European Innovation Council Women Leadership Program, which is aimed at supporting women to go into, let's say, entrepreneurial path and start their own company here in Europe. Uh, as I said, my experience uh, can, can be kind of, oh, what happened? Okay, uh, resumed in the logos of the different organizations I worked for. I'm not going into the details, but just, just for you to know, the not-for-profit experiences with the Marie Curie alumni and the ISC. Uh, and then my own companies are this one, the SC, which stands for supercomputer. And then the last one, uh, Marmas from and um, and then and this Anila and Liftup are like brands of of my company. Okay, and the, the the other one in exchange is a consulting company I worked with on on a project base. So now, why I'm introducing all these things just to make the um, the introduction of the skills. I could develop in, in, in all the years uh, in, in with these experiences. Okay, so uh, again, there are all the bifurcation, and I said, you know, I had management experience, leadership, I worked in innovation, startup, research. And you see, in all these experiences, I got a bit of uh, uh, different skills, and, and all those experiences allowed me to develop them independently in many different context okay and and um until <clears throat> sorry until the last one that you see on the right hand side which is about managing my company where i need all of those skills all together okay and now who knows what the future will bring mm. So uh, now it is the first company I started, Supercomputer doesn't exist anymore. And uh, I'm not much more active as I used to be in the Marie Curie Alumni Association. I'm more focused on, on the, the, the businesses on, on the right hand side. Now, today I would like to introduce you to the concept of entrepreneurship and why this is relevant for you why it is important for researchers to get other skills. And, uh, and even though I consider the researchers are super highly skilled already, they need to be upskilled. This is the new terms that is being used uh, um, in, uh, in Europe. And then just a, a bit uh, of introduction on innovation, my own story about how it is to build a startup and then very few words about the Lean Startup. So all these things are related both to, let's say, entrepreneurship in general, more about uh, being researchers and entrepreneurs, but also one message that I would like to, go, uh, to, to send very clear is that um, actually the entrepreneurial skills are super important for starting companies and so forth and so on, but are most important for managing also your career. So even if you are not starting your own company, even if you are not going to be innovative also in the third sector, but still you can use these skills to manage your career. So this is something that I consider very important. So first question, 
what is an entrepreneur? To answer this question, I just introduced two, uh, uh, let's say, stereotypical people I've worked with. So they are not real persons themselves, but uh, actually they, um, they are very close to the real ones. Nicole has another name, and then the other person I will introduce has another name, but more or less, what I'm going to tell them about them are about real people. Okay, so Nicole has a PhD in bioengineering. <laughs> she was uh, awarded as the best PhD in Europe in 2015. She is now professor, super young. She's already a professor. Uh, and she started a company uh, during her PhD, which was not related at all with her field of uh, research. It was a crowdfunding platform for artists. So you see, so she had this very cool and great uh, uh, scientific and research uh, CV uh, and great career. And she also started a company. So when I asked Nicole to tell me about her, uh, uh, her secret, right? So she says that in her case, the main point is about seizing opportunities. As I said, the opportunities always comes up. Then it's up to you uh, to, uh, to act on them or not, okay? And then she said that she tries her best to make them fly. If it works, it's great. If it doesn't, it's fine, okay? She, she, she's fine with, with uh, wasting a, a few of her time and effort, okay? Uh, but not much. So when she sees that she doesn't succeed, okay, she moves on. And, uh, and she says that her strengths are optimism and sense of humor. The other person is David. He has a totally different background. Medieval literature, right? So he's an avid reader. He lived in many countries. He has been traveling a lot. Actually, he now lives in Singapore and, and where he started a very successful uh, company using artificial intelligence. You see, again, this is far from his, it, at least it seems far from his field of, of research. But what he says is, is that all uh, 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 tech startups actually would do better using inputs for uh, human or social sciences. So in, in, in his case, he has a, 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 a good idea on how uh, human nature works and how you can you know, like uh, nudge people to, to, to do something, okay? And this is coupled with AI makes his, uh, his startup very, uh, very successful. His strength, curiosity, and open mindset. So you see, you have these two people, highly educated, um, with different uh, characteristics, uh, sense of humor and curiosity, right? Or, or optimism. Uh, but actually, it's very difficult to find some actually a common trait, right? They, they come from, one comes from STEM, the other one comes from uh, humanities. So what, where, where's the secret? What, what are we missing there, right? Now, this brings us back to the original question, what is an entrepreneur, right? And then I give you two answers. One was given by Peter Drucker, who's, uh, who used to be an economist, he's dead now, who has been very active in many fields of businesses. And he wrote a, a super nice book, quite, uh, let's say, quite intense and difficult to read for an expert about entrepreneurship. And what uh, he says that an entrepreneur is a person always searching for change and then responding to it and exploiting the change as an opportunity. Okay, and th there may be many examples about that. So think, for example, about uh, the COVID pandemic. We all lived through that, right? So when when it started, um, and when people and in countries started also saying, "Oh, we might go on lockdown or not," uh, many people only complained about that, right? I was one of the, uh, the people complaining too. I mean, uh, I'm not judging that. But then the entrepreneurs, they started making masks. 
they started working on, on the mRNA, RNA, mRNA vaccines and all this stuff, right? So instead of complaining, they, they saw an opportunity in this changing, in this change that was gonna happen soon, right? And, and then they, they sold a lot of masks, they made vaccines, they sold vaccines, they actually helped the entire society uh, to cope with this pandemic without, I mean, unfortunately there have been many deaths, but it would have been much worse if those people wouldn't have done their part. The other um, definition of an entrepreneur is through entrepreneurship, okay? Entrepreneurship is when you act upon opportunities and ideas and transform them into value for others. This was a definition given by the Joint Research Center, which is the research arm of the European Commission, which made a study about that, published a study in 2016. It's a very nice study. I really uh, suggest you to go through it. It's like 30 pages, not, not very long, but it's very interesting. You see here, there are a few things that are repeating, like, you know, uh, opportunity. Opportunity is in both definitions. Right, and now we have the, uh, the transformation of value for others. I told you the entrepreneurs who reacted to the COVID pandemic by making masks or making uh, um, uh, how you call this gels uh, for for sterilizing your hands and all this stuff and vaccines. They actually added a lot of value to society. Okay, without those entrepreneurs, we would uh, be much worse off than we are uh, to, uh, nowadays. So this is a very important thing. Entrepreneurs not only uh, act on those opportunities, but they actually create value for society. So which kind of value are we talking about? Well, we can identify, let's say, three uh, broad categories. One is financial value. This is very intuitive. You, gener you generate financial revenue. You make money, okay? And you make also, you, in, you cause money to circulate, let's say, in society, okay? Because when you do something, when you make something as an entrepreneur, then there are all the supply chains related to that, uh, and that product or service, right? And, and then you create jobs and, you, uh, and, and then out of your, uh, of your income, you pay taxes. So, you know, this is, this is not only the, the, the money that the entrepreneur puts in his own pocket, but it's also about job creation and, and, um, and, and uh, tax revenues that then help society too. The social value is when you enhance social conditions. Again, I made the example for COVID, but let's let's move to other examples, right? So for example, when you when you produce something for elderly people, for example, okay, services for elderly people, you enhance their uh, social conditions, for example. And then cultural value is when you enrich people's cultural experience. They can be organizing, you know, a, a, a recital in, in a school. Okay, this is uh, already cultural value. It can be a concert. In, in your city, it can be a let's say more scalable business like starting Spotify, right? All of this is actually about enriching people's cultural experience. So these are the, the different value that we can identify, and that they are usually created uh, by by entrepreneurs, and it's not uh, it's not they are not exclusive in the sense that. Uh, one entrepreneur doesn't only create financial or only social or only cultural value. Sometimes you can have two or the three of them at the same time. Now, I mentioned this study from, uh, from the uh, JRC, right? And, and uh, after that, they published what they call the EntreComp playbook. So in their study, they identified what they call the entrepreneurial competencies which are the set of skills, knowledge, and mindset that an entrepreneurial or enterprising person would develop. So they identified three main competencies areas. The first one is ideas and opportunities. 
The second one is resources, and the third one is into action. Now, I cannot go deep into this because it would require already four hours <laughs> introduction about these competencies. But I really, really, if you are curious about those, I suggest you to, to, to Google the study from the GRC from 2016 and then this one from 2020. And, but basically, the main point is that in the ideas opportunities, you have all these competencies that allow you to, to think creatively, to identify the opportunities, to um, consider if your ideas and your vision is, uh, is worth, uh, and, and then consider also all the ethical and sustainable dimension, which is always important. It has always been important in, in business, but nowadays it is something that must be a, and there is a mass for any business. The part about resources is about how you mobilize resources. If you have any entrepreneurial idea, how do you mobilize people? How do you mobilize um, uh, uh, financial resources, for example? This is very, these are very important skills to acquire. Okay. And finally, into action is really working on your idea and trying to make it work, okay? And, and to make it take off. One very important thing I wanna say right now, have you said, uh, seen that in my experience, I work both in the third sector and the private sector, right? Now, when we talk about uh, an entrepreneurial venture in general, it hasn't to be a business. It can be a not-for-profit organization, okay? A lot of innovation is actually uh, made through not-for-profit organizations, okay? So don't think that everything is done for profit. This adding value to society can be done also through not-for-profit organization. And of course, the, I, I, I cannot say uh, when you can use one form or the other, it depends on many different uh, um, parameters. Um, let's say uh, starting a, a for-profit organization is kind of easier because it's easier to get funded. Okay, but of course, if you have a not-for-profit organization, um, you get more trust from the people because they know that you are not doing that for satisfying uh, the shareholders uh, and, and increasing their profit, but rather uh, to satisfy the vision of the, the venture. So, you know, both of them are, are, are good. You can use one of the other depending on, on the case. Now, this brings me to the second part, right? So why is this relevant for you? I took this from the PhD comics, and this is about you know having a life plan and have, and then when reality hits. And this is very funny. I cannot go through it, but if you if you want to take a screenshot, you can have fun with that. And the main point, as I told you at the very beginning, right, is that you can have any plan you have, and maybe there are many people who are very good and actually they they stick to the plan. But most of the time, lives happen. Right, life happens, and you you uh, you encounter bifurcation where you have to make a decision where to go. Right, and being entrepreneurial actually might help you a lot in uh, in considering the new opportunities and deciding which way you want to go. Now, this is important not only because of, of the reason I just said but also because of the times we are living right now. So let's consider what will be the future in a few years, okay? To, to understand it, let's have a look at what happened for the last 20 years. It was started like 20 years ago, more or less with automated manufacturing, like robots in, in, in factories. Then you, uh, the advent of big data and artificial intelligence, right? Well, now we have automated assessment. Actually, it has been seen that AI-driven um, judges are, are more or less uh, similar to, to the, the real ones. Or same for doctors in diagnosing um, diseases, right? 
and and finally we have self-driving car so what all this brings all this technology brings is that the the the, the, um, the job landscape has changed completely now these technologies are kind of substituting the human factor right and, and so uh, we don't need too many people to work in factories anymore uh, soon we, we will not need to drive our cars we will not need, need taxi drivers or bus drivers right this is already a reality in most uh, cities with um, an underground usually now they are uh, they are not driven by the real dr uh, driver but it's all managed by a computer right so you see this is changing and what else is, is uh, happening now, uh, nowadays? So we have 2.5 quintillion bytes stored every day. If you want to know what a quintillion is, look at these numbers. I can even count the number of zeros that are there. So what does that mean in practice? That we produce so much information every day that all the information that was stored since the beginning, uh, since the discovery of the writing, right? Since the first written documents, until two years ago, that amount of information, like produced in five thousand years, was produced for the last two years. So it, we have this acceleration in producing information that in two years we could produce the same amount of information that was produced in five thousand years by humanity. Okay. And finally, it's not only about technology, but there is a huge change happening around us, right? So you have the climate change and the aging population, like just to cite the most important ones. We have pandemics we are living through, right? These are huge changes, right? So now what we observe, technology, humanity, like I, I don't have the, the, the crystal ball, right? But what we can say is that we observe all these changes. So there must be something that we that is uh, waiting for us in the near future and the main point is that we have all those changing picking up quickly and it is quicker and quicker so at, at the time of my parents or already or also when i was younger right it was not that quick okay so it was normal that a person would start with one job and stay in that job for his lifetime, right? 35 years, 40 years, whatever. It was quite normal. This is something we cannot afford anymore, okay? And actually, the point is that the, the change is so quick right now that humanity generally struggles to keep up with that change, right? So uh, you cannot actually, just, just if you think of, of the amount of information, you cannot cope with all that information. You, you need filters. You need to filter it out, right? And still with it, it's still a lot, it's still very overwhelming. So what then, right? So what is the solution? What, what are we going to do? The main thing is that we keep learning and develop skills that are uniquely human, okay? Skills can, that cannot be replaced by machines. So when I made the example of the doctors, right? So now machines can make a diagnosis um, that is, let's say, um, with a um, better success uh, uh, rate than doctors, okay? But then, uh, you know, uh, nurses are highly in, in need, needed because you need the empathy to treat the, 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 the patient, right? So you cannot, give the patient to an, a computer with AI and things like that. So this kind of uh, human skills are super important. So what, in particular, the OECD actually uh, made a list of the skills. I'm not very fond of lists because how can you say which is the most important, the second, second most important? Uh, that's why I put these in the first uh, few skills and, uh, that are uh, in, in the list as, as uh, with the same importance. What you need is empathy, critical thinking, creativity, communication, you know, collaboration, curiosity, and ethics. Again, the ethical dimensions comes back all, uh, 
over and over again, okay? So these are the main skills that you need to develop for your future, okay? And um, it's very interesting because these were made by two different entities. The same skills are actually the entrepreneurial skills, okay? So now you have the skills that the OECD recognizes as being the skills that you need to, to thrive in, in, in our future that is uh, so overwhelmed with information and always changing, right? And the same skills actually appear in the entrepreneurial competence framework that was published by the GRC. Now you can see in, in how, how important it is to develop those skills. Now let's come to researchers, okay? So, we said why this is relevant in general, but why is this relevant for researchers? Well, first of all, it is relevant for researchers because not all of you will stay in research, but we stay, we, uh, we work in other sectors, private, public, third sector, whatever, right? Start their own business, uh, start their own no profit, whatever. So career-wise, it's important for researchers that are going out of academia, but interestingly enough, it's important for researchers staying in academia too, exactly for the same reasons, because for any career, you need those skills, okay? In, in the fact that academia tends to be more conservative and traditional shouldn't trick you in thinking that you can survive there without developing those skills. So this is something that I would like to, to, to insist a lot more. Now, more on the side of innovation, researchers actually are very lucky because they already developed some of those skills in their uh, research experience already when they start their PhD, okay? And some of them are perseverance, right? Because you know very well how hard it is to stay in a lab or to run like a, 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 an experiment uh, mm, or to look uh, for, for some proof in, in, in history, whatever, in any type of research, you need to persevere. You need motivation for that, but all, uh, also the ability to learn. So you develop a, a, a kind of the skills to learn very quickly, to understand what are the important things, what are the less important things, just with a quick glance or a quick read through a document. You also develop a rigorous analytical approach, whatever science you are, both uh, human and, 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 uh, and natural sciences, you always need an analytical approach to understand the problem. And then to solve a problem, you need curiosity, and creativity. So creativity is often associated with arts. And of course it is something that is associated with arts, but people uh, uh, very rarely think that creativity is something related also to science. Actually creativity is very connected to solving problems. Okay, when you hear people thinking out of the box, for example, that's something that is typical of a creative person. Now, if you get a bit of business training, okay, you develop some business expertise, some startup experience, you would learn about strategy and accounting and bringing these two things together, they would make you like innovative entrepreneurs, okay? And, you know, the, 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 the main thing I would like to, uh, main things that I would like to stress here is that it's mostly knowledge-driven innovation, okay, which adds a lot of value to society, okay, and that's we are back to the the concept of value to society, okay. This is very important. Now and uh, very quickly, uh, and this is one brand of my company that I started a few years ago, and it is the, the one that is mostly related to upskilling researchers. Okay, and I started with entrepreneurial skills. So I took this name from like a very old uh, uh, book, uh, 2000 years ago, more or less, about the, the nature of things. And what uh, the guy used to say is that nothing is born out of nothing. Okay, 
And this makes the connection to entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship that is something that re revolutionized the economic structure from within. This is in the words of uh, the, the most famous economists who started uh, 100 years ago talking about entrepreneurship, okay? And uh, he says that it, it revolutionizes the economic structure from within, okay? So it's nothing that comes out of nowhere, right? Is not nothing is is not born out of nothing. It's just built on what was before, and it changes it. Okay, so it destroys the old structure and create a new one. Okay, this is what entrepreneurship is in the vision of jo jo Joseph Schumpeter. Now. Uh, after Enilo, I started also uh, this uh, working on LiftUp. LiftUp is uh, is mostly uh, oriented to startups and consulting them and helping them with uh, with raising funds. And then Docinans is one of the European projects I'm involved in, which is exactly about enhancing doctor education in order to bring all these skills uh, to researchers. Now, uh, you might be aware that in Europe, there are many, um, many programs to help uh, researchers on the one side. So you have you know, the Marie Curie Actions, the European Research Council, but also innovators on the other side. So you have the European um, Innovation Council that I mentioned at the very beginning, but you have also the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And they work, on different sectors uh, to actually adding value to European society. And I work with them uh, mostly in the AIT food. So it's about improving food industry through innovation and the health in industry through innovation. And I'm mentoring them. And I'm also working with universities to bring a new uh, vision for you uh, uh, for them for the uh, um, research and innovation field in Europe. Now this brings me to talk about innovation. Innovation. What is innovation? Uh, well, it's very hard to define it, and I use uh, I ask my friend Peter Drucker again <laughs> to to tell us what it is. And basically, he identifies innovation as the specific tool of entrepreneurs. Okay, so anything related to innovation is something that entrepreneurs use. Okay, to seize opportunities, and and then bring a different business or a different service. This is innovation. So when I in my in talks uh, I introduce innovation, people think about business opportunities, and this is true. But as I told you earlier, actually, there is a lot of innovation in the public service, in the not-for-profit, in the military, right? And many things were first invented there, and then they came to, to, to be used for, let's say, more public use. And uh, what else they think of technology, but actually there's a lot of innovation that is not associated to new technologies. Okay, so for example, social innovation. What, my favorite one is about the installment payments. So now for you is kind of quite of a normal thing, right? To go buy your car and instead of paying it, um, let's say full price, you pay every month some installment, right? So you pay whatever, 500 euros, whatever, uh, every month for five years or, or more, right? So actually this was introduced slightly more than 100 years ago. And, the, and until then, People couldn't pay, couldn't uh, pay this way. That meant that only rich people who had enough cash to buy a car, let's say, or anything, could uh, do that, right? Uh, while all the other people who didn't have enough cash couldn't have access to the services of products that were sold. So when installment payments were invented, actually that meant that even people from the um, lower class could afford buying new tools, new services, and these allowed them to make more money, right? And then this brought them to, to access to the, to the middle class, 
okay? So this is very important. Even, even this uh, innovation that looks so like trivial and like stupid ideas actually have a huge impact uh, to society. Then again, people uh, talk about artificial intelligence. Yes, there's a lot of hype about artificial intelligence, but what about climate change? Actually, if you look at the most innovating companies nowadays, not all of them are with artificial intelligence. Actually, many of them are about uh, um, contrasting the, the uh, climate change or helping society coping with that. And then Steve Jobs, for sure, he was a great innovator, but there are also other innovators that are not known. I, I always mention Douglas Engelbart. So if you have uh, time, please Google um, Douglas Engelbart and the mother of all demos. And, and it is a, a nice video where uh, you can see that all the technologies that were later developed by Steve Jobs and Apple Computer Zoom and other producers already existed in the late 60s. And uh, so, you know, this is very important because um, it was, in, uh, although the technologies used to exist by then, they actually had an impact in society much later. Okay, so actually it, it's been uh, checked by economists that only in the 90s, in the mid 90s, could uh, the computer actually make a real impact on economy. So uh, until uh, mid of the 90s, computers were less than 1% of the GDP in, in, in the United States. So I see that there is a, a question um, asking for some tips uh, to people having an idea for a tech startup. Okay, we have no formal education. And uh, Arim asks, I guess one way would be networking, but how long would it be to develop trust with prospective partners? Uh, this is a very uh, good question. I will go into that very quickly soon. Let me, let me jump very quickly on this message about the fact that innovation, technical innovation might take a long time, okay? For example, the deep learning started with early studies in the 40s, 1940s, until was all of the hype for the last, let's say 10 years, more or less, okay? So don't think that uh, all technological innovation uh, actually has an immediate impact. And I just um, skip through those slides because um, there are, I just want to go to the take home messages, like the fact that the entrepreneurs thrive in change and seize opportunities. Innovation is a tool used by entrepreneurs. It's often a slow process. Being entrepreneurial is important for your future and for your careers. Entrepreneurial people add value to society, okay? And, and universities will change deeply, okay, to foster this entrepreneurial attitude. So my suggestion is you use your knowledge to find new solution to old problem. This is how to be entrepreneurial. Now, I will skip many more slides and go to the questions that, that, that was asked. Let me, what happened? I went too fast, probably. This was a story about my own startup. So the lean startup. So how do you start a company if you have any idea? Okay, I will be very quick about that. This is to answer the question that was asked in the Q&A. And we all already went to, to the, uh, we already spoke about value, but one uh, thing that I want to actually stress is that the value is the benefit, okay, that you provide to a person, to a customer. Okay, and you provide this, this benefit through, let's say, a service, through a product. Okay, if people don't see any benefit in what you provide to them, they will not buy your product. Okay, so you have to focus on the benefits for your customer, not on the features. This is something that everybody, every early entrepreneur 
always uh, confuses, okay? So don't, don't think about the features of your product. That will come later. Try to develop uh, a concept about the benefits, okay? Like Thomas Edison used to say, I found out what the world needs, then I go ahead and invent it. Now, you should consider a startup, let me skip, as an experiment, okay? And as all experiments, it can go well, badly, but basically what you get out of this startup is learning, okay? And the learning process is very similar to what happens in science. Now here there is, you know, you make an hypothesis, you build an experiment, measure, learn from it, and decide what to do next, okay? This is exactly the same for a startup. You see, think, oh, this customer has these needs and I have a solution for the needs. Then you make some tests that are called, we cannot, we cannot go into the details of that, but I just tell you, they are called minimum viable product. Okay, and you run those tests and then you learn. So a startup is a learning process. You learn from this test and then decide what to do. Okay, either you abort or you pivot, meaning that you change a bit your vision or you keep been there and run more tests and, and continue learning, okay? So all the first year, or in some, in some cases, it, it can last even 20 years. It depends. There is no a golden rule, okay? Some startup like Nike took 20 years to start or seriously, okay? And other big companies too. Others, they needed only one year, okay? So it depends. But basically, it's a continuous learning process where you learn, about your customer, okay? You learn what your customer want and how you can provide the benefit to your customer, okay? And eventually, once you have learned, then you launch your product and, and you keep this process, process of learning and improving for, for a long time until you, did, you become a, a real big company, okay? And so now I'm just finishing this up and then I will answer your questions. Just wanted to tell you that you can feel free to contact me through LinkedIn or, 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 or Twitter. On LinkedIn, there is a group which is called Entrepreneurial Researchers. So if you are interested at all, just feel free to, to, to join it. And finally, if you have any further questions, you can contact by email. I, I will try to, to reply as soon as I can, okay? And yeah, that's it for my presentation. I stop sharing the screen now so that you can see. I see that. Mm. Yes, there's a question. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation, Marco. I myself uh, learned a lot, especially yeah. on the financial, social, and cultural value. <laughs> and the entry comp flower. So I was sending um, a link to the entry comp project uh, to the to our attendees here. So yes. what is interesting there is there is this playbook and um, there's a, but there's also a lot of resources inside the website, but there is this playbook where uh, Marco was uh, referring to with the, this entry comp flower. So check on the competencies and maybe identify which ones you know are your strengths and then if there is anything that you have to work on right on on the skills that you need to become a successful entrepreneur slash science scientist slash everything else because we are multi-hyphenates in this in this world there's a question here from truk tran um mm -hmm. and the question is what do you think about the chance for he graduates whose majors are in social sciences to start their own business. They don't have great ability in advanced technology, yet recently many of them can earn much money from YouTube and social media from content making. How do you think about this and what should they do to keep moving forward in business? Yeah, Thanks for this the is a very good, Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, okay, in my opinion, we shouldn't make this mistake of saying, oh, okay, innovation is all about technology and only graduates from STEM can be entrepreneurs. Actually, I know that I had to, to rush through my presentation to, to try to, to give you as much information as I could, right? But one main point is that 
with any background you have, actually, you can run a business. And this business can be online, as you mentioned, like through YouTube or on social, other social media. The business can be, actually, you can think also of small businesses, right? So even, even running a, a small business that is only local, that doesn't mean that you are not a good entrepreneur. You are a, a really good entrepreneur. You are just not scaling up to the global size, right? And you're probably not making as much money as, as you know uh, those people in the Silicon Valley. But who cares, right? I think that the main thing is about actually again finding a way to to uh, to, um, to add value to society by being uh, entrepreneurial. Okay, now social sciences, in my opinion, uh, social scientists, uh, in my opinion have the same odds are natural scientists to be successful also in big businesses. So if I'm not wrong, for example, the founder of Airbnb is an architect. Okay, he has no clue. Well, now, yes, some clue of technology, of course, he has, right? But it's not his strength, right? But he could see that there was a problem and he could see what the solution was. Okay, uh, there are it's plenty of social scientists that are working uh, 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 for big companies and, and big startup in, in, in also in tech startup just because the social um, or the human side aspect is very important. Okay, uh, and you know even if you are a historian, you actually might have something to say in. in um, for what concerns you know things that are happening right now so for example now if you are i've seen historians that are uh, uh, kind of working to uh, give people an idea of what the future will bring right what I, what I did in my presentation but in in a more serious way using history what they learn from history to see what what can happen in future and this is super relevant for many big companies actually uh, big companies uh, want to know what's gonna bring the future in the next 30 years and and these are these where many historians are, are working as entrepreneurs okay so look at entrepreneurship as a very broad thing that you can uh, work in i see that there are more questions um, okay no these are actually uh, there's a question okay, there are, yeah, there's another yes. question from Mu Yen P. Fong Hong. Uh, could you please okay. suggest some startup ideas for English language education teachers, MA students, PhD students? Thank you. Thank you for your question. <laughs> so these ideas, well, uh, now I, I cannot think of them, but you know, education is something that is changing a lot right now so it's it's where there's a lot of innovation okay so for example language teacher i, I have no clue about how to teach language but uh, of course i'm sure that there are techniques that can be adapted to the online world right or uh, let's say new techniques uh, to to teach languages to kids maybe even not online maybe with uh, wooden toys right that uh, and then they get the, the basic logics of of some language you know that you can you can think of many different many different dimensions about what you want to do right and of course i cannot uh, give you some, uh, many ideas also because i'm not experts about teaching languages and um, there's another uh, question. Yeah. Are researchers from a business that is not related to their teaching expertise still consider entrepreneurial? Yes. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, yeah. you're entrepreneurial even if you are not. Uh, I, I showed the example of, of Nicole, right? Who started a business on a crowdfunding platform, even if she was a biologist, right? So the, the main point is about acquiring those skills. And my own experience and my own opinion is that you acquire those skills mm -hmm. by basically uh, making uh, different experiences in your life okay like uh, volunteering in some not-for-profit for example or, or starting your own business if you have an idea try it 
okay you are not successful you learn so much and you develop so many skills that any employer the day after you fail might want to to uh, have you in in their in their company okay so um, yeah being entrepreneur goes beyond just the topic of research yes i agree and i just wanted to read some uh, some comments here for you marco uh, leslie joy mm -hmm. diaz says thank you very much for organizing this i love your topics uh, but she's going to another meeting don't worry uh, another uh, topic uh, another um, comment handi yawarman what a wonderful talk i really appreciate it i got a lot of knowledge today don't worry you will get the recording of this um, in the next days just give us a little time because there's just two of us and my my partner uh, susan is is now back in, in berlin i think she is uh, so it will just be me but i definitely will send you the recording of this wonderful talk of marco um and Jennifer uh, Francisco says, thank you so much for the wonderful sharing and for the great presentation. Indeed, um, that, was, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Marco. Um, maybe we can have one, one, yeah, one, maybe one for the road, one uh, question for the road. Um, as a practitioner and entrepreneur, this is from Dran, what can you suggest a research proposal for a student who took up a dissertation in the context of entrepreneurship who is eager to study which can help the community. Maybe a general um, advice uh, for that, Marco, to, to wrap up our session for today. Mm -hmm. So th this will be about research, right? So a research proposal for, for uh, learning more about that. Mm, uh, this is uh, very interesting. In general, as I said, you know, you can have entrepreneurship uh, that are, it's impacting the community at, at different levels. And uh, for example, I mentioned the one about climate change, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you can see uh, many startups uh, that are um, working in that field. So how do they impact the community? You can maybe uh, write a research proposal where you study a few of those startups, okay? And you see how they alleviate uh, the consequences, for example, of climate change, how uh, communities, uh, let's say, benefit from the products they are, they are providing, okay? This, this might be one. And of course, it doesn't have to be climate change. I just made the example of climate change, but there are so many that, you know, uh, let's, a big proposal would be, so how did vaccine and the development of vaccine in only one year, helped the world, the entire world, get out of the pandemic, okay? Um, this, is, um, this is very important. See, there is uh, also another question about uh, starting a company with low costs. Now, this depends on the type of company, okay? Usually, if it is technology, if it is, let's say, digital technology, is usually very low cost. If it is other kind of technologies, can be very expensive. So medical technologies, for example, can be super expensive. And uh, in the first case, I always suggest to what is called bootstrap. So start with your own money, start to, to like uh, really have the, the most simple product at hand and test it with customers and start selling it to customers, even if it's not nice. But if you're really providing a benefit to, uh, to customers, they will they will buy it, okay? And then maybe you can find some investors. Um, and, and then um, if, if it is other kind of technologies that are very heavy, like uh, medical technologies, having early customers that are already the users, like can be a pharma company using the, the technology, they might invest in you, in you, believe in you, invest in your company, and then you can start uh, and uh, start it with their financial support. Yeah, thank you so much, Marco. So um, Julie Nguyen wow. is here that she's scared of business uh, and she's focusing on research writing, but she says she needs to find good business friends for collaboration. Um, and it says, how can I help you? How can you help me join a good research business group in the EU? Maybe we can take that up. Uh, please write to us on ASEAN and your access that, that. but I, I think it's a nice starting point. You can join the entrepreneurs uh, for researchers. Was it entrepreneurship for researchers? 
LinkedIn group uh, that Marco just uh, flashed. Entrepreneur by. resources. Uh, entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's uh, shared it a while ago. Yeah. So please uh, join that. Um, that would be a nice start. And I think when it comes to ideas of finding, you know, um, uh, something, uh, I think it's really what you said, Marco, about addressing a need. So if you look at your society, if you look around you, if there is a problem or, you know, a dilemma that your someone is, is grappling with, and, you know, I, I think that, that, that you can start from there. Um, some of the greatest ideas, you know, from my friends um, were really on addressing a problem that they encounter themselves. And then they realized other people are, are in experiencing this too. And so they found, um, you know, a, a business from this and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's running very well. And the other thing also is because of the pandemic, I think to answer one of the questions a while ago, um, on somebody who has like a, a teaching degree, there's actually a, um, a lot of... Um, a lot of great ideas that came because of, of the COVID uh, pandemic. So many put up like, you know, uh, companies um, because of that and, and also running very well at this time. And again, addressing a need because like, you know, there are a lot of people who are doing things remotely and, you know, uh, parents are, you know, overwhelmed. So they put up, you know, online um, tutorial services um, that really, took a load off from 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 parents me included so thank you so much for that and marco i mean i wish we could have you longer uh but uh it's it's i think it was a perfect one hour of a lot of information that i'm sure everybody will unpack in the next days but we will be in touch uh with with all of you thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and your morning uh, and we will be in touch soon again thank you so much have a good afternoon. Thank you. A pleasure. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Marco. Bye.